Hilas mori Hello and welcome to Islam in the Middle Ages, a series for IHSHG examining the Islamic world from Muhammad to the Mughal Empire on the first Sunday of each month. In our last episode, we examined the extraordinary rise of the Assassin Order, and how an obscure religious sect from Persia went on to be one of the most feared organisations in the medieval Middle East, and the inspiration for many TV shows, films, and video games into the present day. Today, we'll be looking at the empires of Mali, and Songhai, two powers that presided over the nexus of the Islamic world in West Africa. These were two of the most extraordinary Islamic powers of the Middle Ages, and one of the most important centres of trade and wealth in the entire medieval world. They are also, sadly, an area that often gets overlooked. It's an unfortunate tendency within this discipline to assume that Islamic history interchangeably means the history of the Middle East. And whilst this is an undeniably important region, it often excludes other, equally as valid parts of the Islamic world, that are worthy of examination. Although the great cities of Gao, Jene, and Timbuktu were miles away from the world of the Abbasids, Crusades, and Mamluks, these were nevertheless thriving centres of Islamic thought and scholarship and they presided over a vast commercial empire that spanned across one of the most hostile regions on earth and produced some of the wealthiest individuals in all of human history. It's this that we'll examine today. We'll start by looking at why this region was so rich in the Middle Ages, and then explore a fascinating lineup of individuals that shaped this empire, including the richest man to have ever lived, a legendary king who didn't walk until adulthood, and quite possibly one of the most controversial rulers in the entire Islamic world. Needless to say, this episode is full of fascinating stories, and I'm really excited to be sharing this with you today. This podcast wouldn't be possible without the support of the IHSHG, and I would like to thank them for giving me the platform to be able to host this. Do be sure to check out their website, Facebook page, and YouTube channel for more historical discussions in English and Portuguese. So, without further ado, let's begin. To best understand Mali and Songhai, it's worth looking first at the Trans-Saharan trade routes that made empire building in this region such an attractive prospect. Both empires were based around a region of West Africa known as the Sahel, just south of the Sahara Desert and covering countries today such as Niger, Mali, southern Mauritania, Senegal, Guinea, and northern Nigeria. The Sahel is a borderland between the arid north and forested south, made up of savannas and dry, grassy steppes. Cutting through it is the mighty Niger River, that produces a fertile belt five times the size of the Nile, and is a major source of wealth for the region, both historically and into the present day. Even before the advent of Trans-Saharan routes, trade in the Sahel flourished, with archaeological evidence as early as 300 BCE of different people groups exchanging goods. By 700 CE, we have evidence of large-scale towns and mud-brick buildings, and specialised craftsmen for ironwork, pottery, and farming. These were the early years of the first of three major powers to rule over this region, from the 3rd to the 16th centuries. This first power was known as Wagadu, or Ghana. Not to be confused, it should be mentioned, with the modern country of the same name. Wagadu 
was quickly able to establish itself as a centre for trade, given the abundant resources the Sahel had to offer. Salt, spices, acacia wood, ivory and iron were all abundant throughout the region, and helped to stimulate trade between different towns and peoples. On a slightly less pleasant note, there was also a large demand for slaves, that could be sold as labourers or soldiers. This was a regrettable, but very real element of life in the Sahel, although it bades mentioning that even at the height of the Trans-Saharan trade in the High Middle Ages, the size and cruelty of this trade didn't remotely compare to the transatlantic trade perpetuated by European colonisers from the 15th century onward. The most important resource that Wagadu commanded, however, was gold. Prior to the European colonisation of the Americas, the richest source of gold in what was then the known world came from the Sahel, and it is estimated that two-thirds of medieval Europe's gold came from West Africa. Likewise, the vast majority of gold dinars from the mint in Kairawan in Tunisia were also minted in gold from this region of the world. The quantity of gold in the Sahel was legendary, and spun a number of stories from both Christian and Islamic writers. In Europe, it was speculated that the legendary mines of Ophir that gave King Solomon his legendary wealth were located here and the kings of Wagadu commanded an enormous mountain of gold that they kept hidden from the world beyond. It was stories like these that drove Europe to try to trade with, and later colonise this part of the world as late as the end of the 19th century, in an attempt to claim for themselves the wealth of this region. In the Islamic world, stories were also spun. The geographer Ibn al-Faqi, opined that gold here grew like carrots in the soil, and people grew and cultivated it, rather like a crop. Contact with the north of the continent would come, however, in 300 CE, when trade through the Sahara was made possible by the coming of camels to the region. Hailing from Arabia, camels were perfectly adapted to transport goods over long distances in desert climates. And so when they came to the Sahel, highly lucrative trade routes began to come into being. Gold, salt, ivory, spices, iron, wheat, and exotic animals were sent to towns in northern Africa and Egypt, and traded there for wheat, fruit, nuts, wine, linen and timber from southern Italy, as well as silk, incense, jewellery and ornaments from the Byzantine Empire and Silk Roads. These goods were then taken back and traded with the locals of the Sahel. Some of the most extraordinary items from the Middle Ages were created thanks to these trade routes, such as the ivory pixides from Al-Andalus and the ivory triptychs or seams that decorated the church of Salerno in the 14th century. This was an extremely lucrative route therefore, and could make some individuals enormously rich. However, from a logistical perspective, these were extremely difficult to navigate. Travel was limited to winter months due to the searing heat of the Sahara and ferocious sandstorms that could reach temperatures of up to 54 degrees centigrade, hot enough to scorch the skin and cause rapid heat stroke. The journey itself also depended on a network of oases especially as food and water supplies were kept to a minimum to maximise the volume of trade goods that could be carried. If any of these were dry, poisoned, or overrun by conquering armies, this could badly disrupt the journey and cause serious trouble for all involved. And the same would happen if the caravan lost its sense of direction. A round trip to and from North Africa would last four months, and the remaining eight months would be needed to rest the camels. And given how well adapted these creatures are, this should tell you a lot about how difficult these journeys could be. Nevertheless, these routes persisted, 
and allowed the Sahel's trade to connect to broader networks across the Christian and Islamic worlds. Owing to the enormous wealth of these routes, powers in North Africa fought bitterly to control them. Part of the reason why the Fatimids sought to invade Egypt, for example, was to better control these routes, and this in turn provoked diplomatic talks between Al-Andalus and the Christian Byzantine Empire to ensure that the Fatimids didn't monopolize trade with Western Africa. It's trade routes like these that allowed the medieval empires of West Africa to flourish. By conquering trading cities and taxing the movements of goods, kings of Wagadu, Mali, and Songhai could command enormous amounts of wealth and influence by having control of some of the most important trading routes of the medieval world. Another key import from Arabia, besides the camel, was Islam, that became the religion of the wealthy, urban elites throughout this part of the world. The faith began to spread to this region in the 8th century, although it was fully established in the 11th, when the Trans-Saharan trade routes were briefly seized and controlled by the El Moravids, the very same ones that also overran Al-Andalus in the same period. The El Moravids were strict Sunnis, inspired by the missionary Abdullah ibn Yasin to spread Islam throughout the world, by force if need be. Although it was a rather aggressive power that bought it, Islam was nevertheless embraced by leaders of the Sahel, and integrated alongside the traditional religious practices of peoples within the region often with both being practiced side by side, or even simultaneously. Islam in many ways was attractive to rulers of this region. Firstly, it gave them a corpus of law from the Qur'an itself, that could be implemented on the basis that it was divinely and not humanly inspired, giving it a markedly stronger air of political and religious legitimacy. Furthermore, it could be used to bolster royal status. Many kings in Mali and Songhai claimed lineage from the tribes in Arabia that fought with the Prophet in the first days of Islam, and these rulers could bolster their credentials further by building mosques and madrasas, commissioning religious and historical texts, donating amounts of their wealth in zakat, and taking the Hajj to Mecca. Further down the social ladder, Local merchants, or diula, converted so that they could build better rapport with the Berbers that carried their goods to the north, and also to avoid the jizya tax that was gradually levied on non-Muslims. This also had an impact on the dynamics of the trans-Saharan slave trade. Under Sharia law, it is impermissible to hold a fellow Muslim as a slave, and it was expected that slaves would later be freed after a period of a few years, typically about seven on average. This proved to be something of a double-edged sword. It allowed many slaves to be freed, and in fact this became one of the biggest sources of legal disputes in the region at the time, when slaves converted to Islam, and then often successfully petitioned to be freed. The flip side of this, however, unfortunately, was an increased emphasis on targeting the non-Muslim population of the Sahel to get around this embargo. The third key impact that Islam had on society in the Sahel was the growth of Islamic scholarship within the region, most prominently in the desert city of Timbuktu. Here, books were written in the madrasas of the town, in a number of languages such as Arabic, Fulani, and Songhai, as well as being imported along the Trans-Saharan routes from major centres of learning, such as Baghdad, Cordoba, and Alexandria. As the town was out in the desert, the warm, dry air prevented books from cracking, allowing Timbuktu to amass a highly impressive library, including manuscripts illuminated with gold leaf that were rightly seen as luxury items at the time. The town of Jene also became a prominent centre of scholarship a century later, where a highly impressive mud-brick mosque was built that still stands today, and in fact, every year, the locals replaster the building to make sure that the bricks remain integral 
Places like Timbuktu and Jene quickly became major areas of learning, drawing in people from across the Sahel to study a variety of subjects there, including theology, philosophy, mathematics, astronomy, and law. Taken together, all of these things helped to fuel the major empires of the region. Trade from the Trans-Saharan routes provided kings with staggering amounts of wealth and the potential for contact across the Islamic world, whilst the faith itself and the scholastic culture it encouraged allowed rulers to bolster their power and cultivate an elite shared culture based on Islam and scholarship around it. Using this, as well as good old-fashioned military conquest, these rulers were able to create the largest pre-colonial empires in the entire history of the African continent. Now, we'll turn to these two empires to explore them in more depth. I'll begin by explaining a bit about the sources that we have to explore this period, that provide both challenges and opportunities in equal measure. First, we have the oral traditions of the Sahel, that are kept and passed on by individuals known as griots, musicians who also serve as historians, storytellers, keepers of oral tradition, and even religious figures in traditional faith systems. These are extraordinary documents that are enormously valuable pieces of cultural heritage, and from a historian's perspective, they're also extremely useful as they tell us how people from the Sahel viewed and interpreted their own history on their own terms. However, one often has to take these accounts with a pinch of salt, as many tend to blend myth and fact, and sometimes alter factual narrative, so accounts have a moral or religious bend to them. The second source, manuscripts of Timbuktu, are enormously valuable too, and we are absolutely indebted to past and present scholars who have gone to some length to keep these books safe from those that would wish to destroy them. An unfortunate reality of both the period itself and the present day. There are two key chronicles of Mali and Songhai history that offer a detailed and rich account of the political and religious history of the area. The Tariqa Sudan, or the history of Africa, and the Tariq al-Fatash, or history of the seeker. Both of these accounts are rich in detail, but again, we must be careful. They were written several decades after the fall of Songhai, and by people who were commissioned to write them, by princes and kings who had a clear motive to skew the narrative in their favour. Finally, we have travel accounts of the 14th century Baghdadi geographer Ibn Battuta, and the 16th century Moorish traveller Leo Africanus. These sources are good for understanding about life in all levels of society, and how the trade processes of this region worked, but they are of course just small snapshots that don't reflect how the society changed over time. It made mentions too, I'm sorry to say, that Ibn Battuta is something of a snob, and tends to be quite unflattering in the way he writes about the Sahel. As you can see, each of these sources can be challenging to understand, but all are valuable, and when taken together, can provide a comprehensive and interesting account of the period as a whole. With that in mind, let's see how this extraordinary series of empires took shape. The Malian Empire was established in around 1235. It was one of several client states of Wagadu, that rose to prominence and took over control of the empire in the wake of an aggressive civil war that shattered Wagadu's power over the region. The first ruler of Mali was a devout Muslim known as Sunjata Keita, a legendary figure in Malian culture even through to the modern day. The story of his rise to power is part of Mali's rich corpus of griot oral tradition, and here I'll share a bit about this tale as it's an incredible foundation myth that's well worth listening to. The story begins with two hunters, brothers from the Traore people, slaying a killer buffalo called the Koba that was terrorizing the kingdom of Sangara, a name for the core territories of Mali prior to becoming an empire. The Koba turns out to be a woman known as Dokamisa, 
who took revenge on her brothers for excluding her from power and ritual at the center of Sangara. Dokamisa foretold of a great ruler that the elder of the two brothers would be a father to, shortly following her death. Relieved that the threat was abated, the king of Sangara offered the elder brother his throne and any one of his daughters to take as a wife. As part of her prophecy, Dokamisa advised the eldest hunter to take the king's tenth daughter, Sogolon, who in many oral traditions is described as alarmingly ugly, and Nyon assaults her husband when they conjugate their marriage, stabbing him in the eye with a needle and spraying him with scorching hot breast milk. Nevertheless, the two manage to have several children together, the eldest being Sunjata. Sunjata was an odd child, who was unable to walk until the age of 17, much to the dismay of his mother, who lamented how ashamed she was that he, quote, could not even use the toilet on his own. This changed suddenly, though, when Sogolon asked one of her attendants to gather baobab leaves for a meal. When she scornfully said that Sunjata should go in her stead, the boy asked for bars of iron from his father's forge, that he bent and broke until he became supremely strong. He walked for the first time, and returned carrying the entire baobab tree. Sunjata rapidly became the best hunter and fighter in his father's army, much to the anger of his uncle, who feared Sunjata would easily take the throne from him on his father's death. The uncle usurped Sunjata's father and exiled him, whereupon Sunjata travelled from kingdom to kingdom, building his strength and learning how to rule. With renewed purpose, Sunjata turned to deposing his evil brother Suma Oro, who usurped his father and killed off much of Sunjata's family to assure his ascendance. Sunjata led the rebellion against him with an allied army, made up of all the minor kingdoms and peoples he had lived with in exile, and despite Suma Oro's attempts to defeat his brother by invoking dark magic and courting the wives of Sunjata's military allies, he was ultimately defeated and his city of Sisu razed to the ground. There are some interesting things to note about this story. For example, the way that traditional Mande beliefs are combined with Islamic ideas. Sunjata not walking until his preordained time is in line with the Islamic idea of maktub, or everything being predestined by God, as well as Mande beliefs that divinity and forging metal went hand in hand with each other. There's also mention of the family dynamics amongst the Mande elite, such as the dynamics of excluding women from power, and the jealousy that could exist between brothers when it came to claiming the throne. We also see suggestions of how Mali justified its empire, by showing that it was a coalition of peoples that ousted Suma Oro for power. Although some themes are clearly fantastical, this is nevertheless a highly fascinating story that tells us a lot about how Mali conceived its elites and how their land came into being. The other prominent ruler of Mali, and perhaps the most famous figure from this period, was the 14th century ruler Mansa Musa, perhaps the wealthiest individual to have ever lived, with an estimated net worth of a staggering 400 billion US dollars. So famous was his wealth, in fact, that he appears on the Catalan Atlas, an extraordinary detailed map dating to Iberia in 1375 that features Musa sitting on a throne holding an enormous gold coin. He came to power in 1312, the successor of the eccentric king Abu Bakr II, who died trying to cross the Atlantic at the head of a huge fleet, believing that there was a land of untold riches on the other side. As ruler of the Malian Empire, or Mansa as his title was known, Musa integrated 24 more cities into his empire and fleshed out trade routes, expanding his empire's borders well beyond what they were in the days of Wagadu. Musa also established diplomatic relationships with Islamic princes in North Africa and set up a great many mosques and madrasas across his different territories. Then, in 1324, he became the first ruler of the Sahel to take the Hajj to Mecca. 
What happened here is extremely well documented and is a fascinating insight into the sheer volume of Mansa Musa's wealth. His caravan on the pilgrimage was comprised of 60,000 men, including 12,000 personal slaves dressed in Persian silk and brocade and carrying large golden staves. He had 80 camels too, with 300 pounds of gold between them, valued by some estimates at half a billion US dollars. En route to Mecca in Egypt, he lavishly handed out gold in zakat, or charitable donations, to the poor his entourage came across, and in wakaf, or charitable endowment, to build mosques in the towns he passed through. He spent so much gold in doing this, that if our sources are to be believed, he crashed the markets of Cairo by flooding Egypt with so much gold as to make the dinar worthless. And to put this into context, Cairo was the single wealthiest point of exchange in the Western world at the time, so this would have been as catastrophic as crashing the New York Stock Exchange or the entire wealth of the City of London. En route back, Musa loaned back much of the gold to try to stabilise prices, and this alleviated the issue, but it's remarkable to think that one man could have such enormous influence over the price of gold in one of the richest areas of the world. A year after the Hajj, Mansa Musa made one of his most ambitious acquisitions to date, seizing the sizable trading city of Gao. Since 1019, this city had been a booming metropolis of trade and religion, both the traditional type and Islam. Gao was an entrepot, where one of the key trading routes to and from the north ended, where goods could fetch very high prices owing to the abundance of gold and demand for imported wares. For merchants, this was a commercial paradise where serious profits could be made. Here, kola nuts, gold, ivory spices, slaves, palm oil, and precious wood could be traded for goods from North Africa and the broader Mediterranean, especially salt, textiles, weapons, and copper. It even impressed the 14th century geographer Ibn Battuta, who, as we've already seen, normally wrote quite derisively of towns and culture in the Sahel, which is a testament to the city's size and cosmopolitan character. A city like this under Malian command, with taxes on the most common commodities, would have seriously bolstered Mansa Musa's revenue and would have been an attractive acquisition to add to his already impressive portfolio of trading towns and provinces. Mansa Musa was therefore an impressive and talented statesman, and under him, the Mali Empire soared to new heights. However, on his death, in a theme that should be all too familiar by now to our regular listeners, everything unraveled dramatically and where one power fell in the region, a new one rose in its place. As strong as Mali was, it had two key problems. First, succession was often a messy and difficult business. Like in other Islamic countries, kings in the Sahel married multiple women and produced large families. Whenever a new ruler was needed, this often resulted in lots of claimants to the throne, and if not solved quickly, opened the way for bloody civil war. This was exacerbated by the fact that the Malian Empire's elites were drawn exclusively from the Mande people. Without any ties or reason to keep supporting an ailing empire, the other groups that made up Mali had the chance to break off and form their own kingdoms, where they could be the rulers of their own territories. After Mansa Musa's death in 1332, both things happened at once. His family fought bitterly over the throne for the next century, whilst Mali's client states started to break away and declare independence. When some states rebelled unpunished, others followed, emboldened by the example, as the empire began to slowly disintegrate without an effective central nexus of control. As this happened, the empire suffered aggressive raiding from the north by Tuareg Berbers and aggressive horsemen from the Mossi people, 
causing the empire to rapidly decline as a result. In a repeat of Mali's rise against Wagadu two centuries prior, however, one state managed to aggressively hold out against the infighting and take over as the new dominant power in the region. The city of Gao, now free from interference by the central powers of Mali, began to gather client states and build an alliance of rebel states of its own, emerging by the 1370s as the Kingdom of Songhai. Songhai waged a successful guerrilla war against the increasingly disorganized Malian army, using aggressive hit-and-run tactics and river boats to rapidly deploy troops in order to run rings around the old empire. Eventually, the fighting paid off, and by 1430, Songhai had managed to grow in size and influence enough to become the new dominant power of the region. For the first 30 years of its time in power, Songhai managed to consolidate itself well, bringing together the old client states of Mali and recommencing trade along the Sahara. However, things came to the fore again in 1464, when the aggressive Songhai general Suni Ali took the throne as Askia, or king. Suni Ali is easily one of the most controversial figures in the history of West Africa, an aggressive military leader who used controlled terror and outbursts of violence to achieve his means. Sources about him are completely divided, with griot oral traditions speaking well of him and referring to him as Ali Bear or Ali the Great, and Islamic sources depicting him as a tyrant and a model of shameful conduct. Once he took the throne, he immediately staged a ferocious campaign against the Mossi horsemen to the north, near what is today Burkina Faso, importing and breeding large numbers of horses to help with the campaign and commissioning iron breastplates for his cavalry to make them hardier in combat. He also developed a large river navy for rapid troop deployment, rather like Songhai had done in the anarchy of the 14th century. The campaign was highly successful, but was often accompanied by acts of astounding violence, including an all-out massacre of the full Bay people, for whom Ali seemed to have a particular and unexplained hatred for. His other most shocking act of violence was sacking and purging the city of Timbuktu, with mass burnings of precious books kept there, and edicts to kill anyone who tried to return to the city after he had expelled its inhabitants. The first crescendo of violence happened in 1468, four years after he took the throne, and there would be five more similar bouts of violence until his death in 1492. From this, it's easy to conclude that Ali was a monster, but I'd like to add a few caveats to the mix. First, there are plenty of examples in our sources of Ali being merciful, rebuilding cities he had conquered and allowing defeated tribes to fight at his side. Secondly, it's worth remembering that many of the sources depicting him as more wicked likely had an agenda of their own. Ali got along famously badly with the Islamic scholars of his court, and sources written after his reign tended to use him as an example of a bad king to bolster the reputation of later Songhai rulers. It's likely, therefore, that his crimes were exaggerated, either by jaded scholars or royal chroniclers afterwards, to try to damage his reputation to pursue a particular agenda. Nevertheless, by the end of his reign, the people of Songhai were pretty sick of him, and started to rally behind a member of his court that was believed to be a far more palatable alternative to the throne the soldier and courtier Askia Muhammad. Muhammad held the position at Ali's court of Tondi Fari, or Lord of the Mountains. This was the northernmost province of Songhai, that bordered the lands of the Mossi and was populated by groups of bandits. It was a challenging part of the empire to rule, but Muhammad did it rather well. This also meant he had an army of his own, in a base of power far from Gao. In addition 
Muhammad was an outspoken critic of Ali, who had been nearly executed on several occasions for arguing with him. This therefore made him an attractive alternative to the increasingly unstable and unpopular ruler. In 1492, the infamous king died, only for rebellions to break out throughout the Songhai Empire. As many states broke away from Gao, the rebels pledged their support for Askia Muhammad, who won a decisive victory against Ali's son Biru at the Battle of Anfao, and took the throne for himself. Askia Muhammad was a very different kind of ruler to Sunni Ali, and rapidly implemented a variety of effective reforms to both repair the damage Ali had done and to bolster his empire further. He was first and foremost very aware of the reality that he was the head of a multi-ethnic empire that had no qualms about violently asserting themselves if their needs weren't met. To that end, he built close links with all 24 of the major people groups within his empire, including the badly persecuted Fulbay, and invited them all to go on Hajj with him in the hopes of building alliances with them. He also centralised the state quite significantly, reforming the tax code, implementing standard weights and measures, organising the empire into provinces with a governor he appointed himself, and commissioning wazirs for key areas of policy. In addition, he regularly consulted with the scholars of Timbuktu for political and religious advice and also settled grievances that the scholars had with griots. Furthermore, he sent diplomatic envoys to North African princes, and freed slaves in military service to be replaced with professional volunteers. These were highly popular reforms, and as a result, the Songhai Empire entered into a golden age over the 40 years of Muhammad's reign, where its borders reached the greatest extent they ever did under the control of one person and things once more returned to peace and prosperity, continuing to supply sizable quantities of gold, ivory and salt to the Mediterranean world, in spite of the influx of precious metals through Spain via South America. Sadly though, like Mansa Musa two centuries before, Askia Muhammad's highly successful reign ended in tragedy when he died. Towards the end of his reign, he became blind, and gradually stepped back from ruling, with rumours beginning to spiral that his wazir was the real power behind the throne. He was banished by his eldest son Musa in 1529, as infighting broke out between his sons. Civil war returned once again, and the empire began to break off into smaller states that supported different claimants to the throne. Because of the disruption to trade routes, Arms and horses struggled to make their way to the Sahel as the war raged on. To cover expenses, the enslavement of enemy troops became a common practice amongst rulers, something that, I'm sorry to say, European traders took advantage of as the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade began to come into being. The final nail in the coffin came in 1591. The Kingdom of Morocco, emboldened but cash-strapped by a victory over the Portuguese crown a few years prior, decided to seize the wealth of Songhai for themselves. Sending a band of Spanish mercenaries armed with muskets and cannon down the Saharan routes, they were able to defeat the Songhai army and crack open the empire for the final time at the Battle of Tondivi, causing it to break off into many smaller states from which it would never recover. It's an unfortunate end for what was the longest and most ambitious empire in Africa prior to European colonisation. The policies created by unifying the trading towns of the Sahel are a fascinating example of how an Islamic kingdom could thrive far away from the world of the Middle East, and also how Western Africa was an economic powerhouse in this period, providing some of the most sought-after trading goods in the world and establishing the basis for thriving, multi-ethnic empires to be built on the back of its staggering wealth. As impressive as a place this was though, 
it sadly wasn't immune to the realities of political strife, and it was the classic problems of dynastic struggle and client states rebelling, so common amongst the medieval Islamic world, that ultimately saw its downfall in the end. In our next episode, we will go right to the other side of the Islamic world to examine the rise of the Mongols, their rise and why they were so effective, and the Islamic policies that came out of their conquests. Thank you very much for listening, and see you in the next episode.